Hi, you're listening to Record of Change. My name is Matthias and I'm your host for this episode. Record of Change features the stories of individuals from across the world about how their lives are being shaped by the COVID-19 pandemic. We listen to our interviewees at several points in time because we want to follow their stories of how their lives are changing. This is episode 3 of our fourth season. In today's episode, we listen again to Mike van Gaan in Cape Town, South Africa, who is a theatre practitioner and activist. In season 1 and 2, Mike had already shared with us what impact the pandemic had on the theatre and dance scene in his country, but also how he co-founded the STAND Foundation to help the sector become more self-reliant and resilient. In today's episode, Mike will share with us how solidarity is growing among historically divided cultural practitioners and also how they are confronting politicians and demanding a more transparent and just system of public subsidies. When Mike and I talked last time in November 2020, the Stan Foundation was just two months old, so he'll share with us today what the Foundation has achieved in the meanwhile. Let's listen to him. November, so that's, wow, that's like nearly six months ago. Yes, it's been actually November 3rd, the day of US elections. Yeah. And we're both saying, yeah, let's let's see what comes out there. And, <laughs> and yeah, you've been telling me that you were looking forward for a, like a six week break, if I remember correctly. And Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think that really happened, but I was looking forward to it then. Yeah, <laughs> like I'm looking forward to three days off next week, and that doesn't look like that's going to happen either. But um, mm. here we are. Things are hectic as usual, but, you know, kind of exciting. It's kind of like this ambivalence of being in a country where there's just so much happening all the time. You know, like every five minutes, there's something that's kind of taking place. And so it's exciting on the one hand in terms of opportunities that present themselves to be able to respond to. On the other hand, it's completely and utterly exhausting because, you know, you kind of wish for a degree of normality. <laughs> for, so I do try to maybe go and take a walk every now and then and, you know, go to gym and just make sure that there's a little bit of self-care that happens in between all of the hecticness and the demands of the time. So what is happening every five minutes? Give me an idea. Okay, so I guess when we last spoke on the 3rd of November last year, the Stan Foundation, I think it was about two months old. So we launched on the 1st of September last year. And so by the time we spoke in November, things were kind of still young. We were just getting up and running, as it were. And now, seven months later, you know, there's been quite a lot that has been achieved. We've done a whole bunch of different projects like a women's stand-up comedy project, like a satirical writing project, that was all happening. We've kind of done a summer school, a series of 17 different short courses aimed at the dance and theatre sector during this COVID times for people to be able to upskill themselves and find new stimulating ways of doing things. So for example, one of the courses was on how to use social media to create a play. Another course was on how to use theatre in a more kind of socially engaged way. So there was that, there was another course on entrepreneurship and how to survive within the theatre and dance world as entrepreneurs. <laughs> we also had a, a series of dialogues over a weekend where probably for the first time since 1994, the democratic elections in 1994, we had the diversity of people in the same room over a weekend talking about themes that were of consequence to the arts community at this particular time. And ironically, post-1994, where one would think in a post-apartheid situation, the arts community would kind of come together. In fact, there's kind of been a splitting apart because particularly the white Afrikaans sector of the arts community has been able to be resourced by virtue of white Afrikaner capital being benefited under apartheid. And so that community are having resources to be able to put on their own festivals and to provide work for uh, white Afrikaans theatre and theatre makers. On the other hand, black folk had kind of been denied access to public funding in the past. And I think that what COVID-19 has done, it's kind of shown that everybody's in the same boat. It didn't matter whether you were white and Afrikaans or black, you didn't have audiences, you couldn't have a festival, you didn't have an income. And all of you were affected in pretty much the same way. And through something like Stan Foundation, we've been able to bring people on board who kind of ran, for example, um, two of the major Afrikaans festivals. So they're part of the Stan board. And through that, they came into contact with other people from the more kind of black theater and dance experience. And so as a consequence, they were able to bring people together. We were able to put money into that event, bring people from around the country. 
And it was an incredible experience, you know, with people, as I say, meeting each other for the first time, but also meeting together in a physical space for the first time in more than a year. So I think in a way what we've begun to see over these COVID times and through initiatives like the Stan Foundation is ironically um, a bringing together of the theatre and dance community in ways that more sympathetic conditions prior to COVID-19 simply did not facilitate or didn't really encourage, you know. So, so that's kind of been quite good. And that's actually been taken into another step where what has happened over the last while is that government has made money available for artist relief, but it's been so poorly managed. They've given the money to our National Arts Council, uh, which has just done a completely and utterly incompetent job. So in November last year, there was this call for people to apply for funding, and people did. And the old Arts Council, I say old Art Council because they have a three-year kind of term, that council made decisions by the end of December last year. A new council came in in January of this year and just about kind of upturned their decisions. So the previous council kind of on the basis of the applications received made allocations to about 640 applications and the money had to be used by the end of March of this year. And so people were delighted to receive these contracts and money and they began to make arrangements because even though they did not have the money in their accounts, because of the time limit that they had to use the money, they made kind of bridging finance arrangements and set off on particular projects and began to do these, this work only for a new council to come in and say, well, actually, there are 700 more applicants that we would like to give funding to. And so the original amounts that we allocated, we are now going to be slashing that quite substantially by between 30 and 60%. So, of course, that created a huge crisis within the sector. And that's a crisis that has been ongoing to the extent that at the beginning of March, on 3rd of March, about 15 artists occupied the offices of the National Arts Council and basically went in there and asked eight questions and said, we won't leave until these eight questions are answered, like, where's the money, who got the funding, how much did they get, who on the council has received funding and how much, why were the decisions changed and the like. And to this day, many of those questions have not been answered, so that even today, those artists are still occupying the Arts Council offices. Wow. It's the 45th day of occupying these offices because for some of them, as they're saying, we've lost our houses. So sleeping over in the National Arts Council office provides us with a roof over our head and the support from outside is allowing us to eat every day, you know? Um, so that's like the weird thing when protest actually becomes the way in which you survive. Wow. And how is this occupation perceived? Like, are people supportive? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a whole other subject. First of all, just in answer to your question, it's incredibly well supported from the arts community. For me, the fact that it's gone for this long is great at one level, showing a degree of resilience and tenacity. On the other hand, it shows a lack of strategy on our part because it should not have gone on this long in terms of what the aims of what that occupation were. We should have been able to sort that out a lot easier and earlier had there been more strategic kind of interventions on our part as organized structures. And what is the politician situation or stand at the moment? Well, this is the thing. The minister is a complete and utter coward. He's just completely useless. So he wanted to have a meeting with the occupiers, ask them to meet him at the market theater, which is opposite the building where the National Arts Council is. And the occupiers said, no, we're not going to leave because that's going to be your strategy to get us out of here. So we're going to stay here. You know where we are. Come and visit us here. He declined and said, let's have a meeting online, which then happened. But he did not arrive to the online meeting. He had one of his officials basically host the meeting. And the poor excuse was the minister had a prior engagement. So he's a real coward. So, you know, it's only kind of exacerbated the calls for him to be fired. The president has not said a single word. The president is also completely absent. The president is also completely useless with regard to this. Oh, also, at the end of, at the end of January, despite, you know, the complete lockdown and the impact on the theatre and dance community, our Minister of Arts and Culture tweeted that theatre was alive and well in our country. 
and he pointed to the five theaters that his department subsidized. And of course, this created a huge outcry because even in those theaters, there was nothing happening. But this just kind of reflected the minister was completely out of touch and so on. And so some of us initiated a petition basically calling for him to resign. And of course, we knew Mm -hmm. that would not happen. But what it did, though, was it created a context in which there was momentum in which we could organize the theater and dance community. There isn't an organization that represents the dance and theater sector as a whole. And so that momentum with more than 2,000 signatures garnered in a couple of days kind of created a momentum for us to say, hey, we need an, a structure that can represent the dance and theater community on an ongoing basis, not just during COVID times, but on an ongoing basis in terms of not to respond to ministers' silly tweets, but to be there to monitor policy implementation, to advocate for new policies, to advocate for new funding strategies, to make sure that when debacles happen, like with the Arts Council and the allocation of artist relief funding, there was a body that could act on behalf of artists. So from the middle of February, we basically initiated a very ambitious six-week program to launch the Theatre and Dance Alliance. Ta-da! That's the acronym. And that's what we did. So we've got a new Theatre and Dance Alliance with a constitution, with an elected national steering committee, and they had their first meet on the 29th of March, which is all consistent with the six-week program that we had set up. So now in the process of setting up working groups to look at you know, different aspects of the of the dance and theatre sector that will be taken up by this thing. So, yeah, that's essentially the kind of thing that has been happening here. Long answer to your question, but there we go. <laughs> As you described it, I imagine that in pre-COVID times, theatre people that are white and that are black would, generally speaking, not really collaborate. Do I get it right? Well, in a way, there wouldn't be any legal kind of obstructions to collaboration, as was the case under apartheid. But because of the marginalization of black people under apartheid in terms of accessing not just public resources, but also private sector resources and so on. It really was always those with skills and networks and access to resources, mainly white folk at the time, who were the people who could unlock that. And so collaborations between white and black people happened on the basis of white people making the conditions available for that to occur. So in a post-apartheid situation, that fundamentally changed. And within the publicly funded theatres, black autistic directors who were able to stage work without needing white interlocutors, because now they have access to public resources from an essentially black government, to be able to stage work by black theatre makers and so on. So the white, particularly Afrikaans theatre makers who were given a priori kind of access to the old subsidized theatres, no longer really found themselves comfortable in those spaces and didn't really have access to them. So they went off and formed their own festivals all around the country. And that was the basis upon which they were able to create work. Their audience was very much a white Afrikaans audience. Very few people in the black community spoke Afrikaans. But that's how the theatre community was sort of divided, just by virtue of history and by virtue of who had resources in a post-apartheid kind of situation. Now, post-COVID, with everybody being in the same position, there's been a kind of recognition that we need to work together. So an organization like TADA, for example, now has a steering committee of 26 people, and probably 15 of them are black, and 11 of them are white. And in a post-apartheid situation, there are very few organizations that have that kind of demographic. So it's like the artists who are occupying the Arts Council, all of them are black artists. The people whom they are fighting at the Arts Council, all of them are black. So there's now a recognition that, in fact, maybe we need to be working together much more as a sector, including white folk who have historical privilege, instead of like pointing out privilege and say, see, you are bad because you've inherited privilege. It's now a case of how do we use what people have had access to because of privilege in the interest of the sector as a whole, while continuing at the same time to lobby and advocate government to create better conditions, policy and funding wise for the sector. So I think in a way it's like help the sector to mature a bit, you know, because the politics of division were quite immature. It was very, very basic racial divides and yeah, that that were rooted in history, but weren't very helpful in terms of helping the sector as a whole to move forward. In the theatre sector here in Germany, maybe there's a kind of growing solidarity still 
the publicly funded theaters, they're just hoping things to get over and not to be that bad in the end. And people in the free off theater, so-called, yeah, they're just devastated. And I see people around me, friends of mine, just skipping their jobs, being actors, actresses, and now working in a vaccination center. So this observation of we are all in this together, I, I lost hope in this sense, you know. Well, what is interesting is that the publicly funded theatres haven't really come to the party, you know, in terms of this new dispensation. And what is happening is that a lot of the independent sector are beginning to see these publicly funded theatres as being part of the problem. And they continue to consume probably 80-90% of the funding available for theatre in the country. Mm. And it's basically for infrastructure because the funding is not really to put anything on the stages and we're calling for that to be radically changed. And then for money to be shifted from subsidizing these five theaters to funding companies. At the moment, we have no nationally publicly funded companies in our country. There are companies that exist, but they all exist by virtue of their own box office income. And we are saying that each of the nine provinces must have at least one theater company and one contemporary dance company that is subsidized by the state. And if that is the case, we could have up to 30 companies, each of them employing about an average of 12 people, that would be 360 people waking up in the morning, going to work as practitioners, and that would still cost a third of what the nationally subsidized infrastructure is costing at the moment. And we think that's a much better use of public resources for theatre and dance, and you'll be creating much more access to theatre and dance around the country because these companies will now be decentralized and they'll have a schools program, they'll be located in infrastructure that is decentralized as well, so more people will have access. So anyway, those are the kinds of things that we are wanting to push through an organization like the Theatre and Dance Alliance. So when you say we, you mean the Theatre and Dance Alliance. What is your role there? Yeah, so we kind of birthed it as the Stan Foundation. So there are nine of us who are the board of directors and are quite networked, most of us, within the sector and globally. And we are able to take initiatives, plan projects, raise money, and just be quite agile in the way that we intervene. But we've always recognized, through our discussion document as well, the need for an advocacy structure that is beyond us, that takes policy issues that we might be sympathetic towards, but it will have the membership and the critical mass to be able to lobby for these things. So hence our birthing of TADA, and we basically drove that. So I served as the secretariat to drive the birth of TADA and then step back to allow the new National Steering Committee to appoint a new secretariat to take things forward. But I continue to serve on the National Steering Committee at least for a year. And then I said, I'll withdraw and retreat into STAND. So in a way, STAND in its seven months has been quite influential, not just in creative projects that we've kind of intervened in creating, but also theoretical discussions and so on, but now also in terms of developing networks that are about advocacy and the like. So yeah, I'll still be there. And it's interesting though, because... One of the strategies is obviously to bring in younger people, they need to take over from us, we've been around forever. But because we've got experience and networks, and so we're able to push things a lot quicker. The younger folk coming in don't know, there's no institutional memory, they feel things are going too fast, you know, slow down. So this is kind of ambivalence that you're trying to do three things at the same time. Build a network that is advocacy oriented around the membership that is in a desperate situation right now, trying to raise the funding for it to sustain that organization and its projects going forward, and then integrating younger people as part of its leadership team to be able to acquire the knowledge that they need to provide the leadership that the organization requires at the same time as the desperate need of its members for something to happen. Basically, you've been working in organizational spheres now for many months, and I know you're also being a creative. So what did you as a creative learn in the last year? So over the last year or so, to be quite honest with you, I've done very little creative work. I've done one play, but that was largely a commission from one of our country's kind of busiest theaters, the Baxter Theater here in Cape Town. And I was commissioned by its artistic director to do a new play, she said, about these times, but not of these times. But the challenge was to do the play with five other writers. 
then eventually we we had a script that was supposed to have been rehearsed at the beginning of this year, January, and then performed. But because of COVID and lockdown, the theatre had to shut down again. So that's the only kind of creative work that I've worked on and then spent much of the time trying to do things that responded to the needs within the sector. So, you know, it's it's probably one of my problems is that I come from a history of activism. So it's not like I need a tada or I personally need a stand, but it's the sector that kind of needs it. I mean, I could go on and write plays and produce plays and raise money to do that. But that's not all that I'm about. You know, it's about how does one change the world? How does one create a better society? How does one create a better context in which the sector can do its work in terms of its contribution to human and social development kind of things? And then the creative work is something which I need to find time. I've actually just last week decided that maybe I should set aside a Friday to just doing some writing work. So yeah, because it's been quite a hectic period of building things up. And maybe now I can, you know, ease off a bit and and spend a bit more time working on my own creative work as well as continuing to sustain something like like stand yeah and would you guess already that covid has some impact on your work in its aesthetics or in its content so obviously what happened with covid and its impact on audiences and the like everybody kind of went the online route i mean i did two pieces online as well and they 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 just didn't really work you know i mean so much of the work that we do requires a live audience so i think that what will eventually happen in terms of aesthetics is that covid has shown us there's probably going to be a new genre that will emerge, theater that is made particularly for the online space. And there might be two versions of it, the one that is filmed in front of a live audience, and then there's going to be work that is created with multi-cameras without an audience for the digital kind of platform space. And then we're going to need to maybe change our definitions of theater because we understand theater at the moment has been that live encounter between performers and people who happen to be in the audience. Um, so at a personal level, I'm actually thinking of one of the things that I'm busy writing at the moment is a piece of stand-up comedy using COVID-19 as its premise, but particularly looking at inequality with regard to COVID, how COVID-19 has kind of exacerbated the inequalities and not just inequalities with regard to vaccine nationalism and the like globally, but also how it's kind of exposed the other things that we have taken for granted or ignored and to do it through humor and through satire so that people don't feel threatened but makes them think and so that's that certainly will be one thing that i do i'm not too keen on developing the whole online platform thing i'm i'm much more inclined to look at how to make it much more accessible to people in physical spaces outside of formal theaters maybe in people's homes particularly once you know, there's herd immunity or people have been vaccinated, which could take forever in this country. I think less than 300,000 people have been vaccinated in our country to date. And those are only kind of health workers. So it's going to take a while before people kind of feel comfortable about that. But, you know, people are already going back because of social distancing. You can do it in spaces where people are apart. So that's going to be much more where I'm going to be spending energy and time. How do I do what I do with people in conditions that are COVID-19 sensitive rather than kind of pursuing the online route. And we're interested in the, in the idea of doing the same story as a play, as a novel, and as a six-part television series. So that I'd be interested in, in pursuing mm -hmm. because eventually I'm not going to be an activist in the sense that I am now. I mean, I see Tada, for example, has been my last contribution to building a network. I've done so many of these in the past. This is my last one with regard to that. If it happens and takes off, fantastic. If it doesn't, pff, sorry guys, I tried my best. And so, you know, then I'll kind of move more into, into writing and writing in different forms, writing plays, writing novels, writing poetry, writing television and film scripts. And so, yeah, that's why I see the future kind of heading at a personal, at a personal level. Yeah. So that's, that's it. That sounds good. But then you really have to start with taking Friday off, starting from next week. Yeah, <laughs> and then maybe a Wednesday as well, and then a Monday. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. I would like to know from your perspective, because you already 
touch the topic of vaccination. What's the current situation around you? Yes, in fact, in many ways, to be quite honest with you, things are almost back to normal other than having to wear a mask when one is outside. We certainly, you know, we don't not go to restaurants. We go to the movies. We go to the theater when theater happens. We go for walks outside. I've kind of gone back to gym. So things are pretty much normal. But, you know, now that you know how COVID is spread, you take the necessary precautions. And so I think that what there is also now within the theatre community, a bit of a lobby for theatre to be opened a bit more, because at the moment, indoor spaces are up to 100, and people are saying that's ridiculous, you need to limit it according to the size of the venue. So if a venue can accommodate a 1,000 people, do a percentage of that rather than limiting it to 100. But yeah, I think that people are slowly beginning to to come back um, to the theater. And then one of the people who is on our stand board, she runs the ballet company here in the city. And she was saying that it was just such a delight to be back in the theater in Durban last two weeks ago. Only 100 people in the audience, but nevertheless provided them with an income that will be able to see them through for the next two months. So I think that that's what's beginning to happen that the company, which a couple of months ago basically had to retrench, you know, nearly 15 people, is now able to generate some kind of income. But it's like a hand-to-mouth kind of existence. Without public subsidy, they literally are living from one month to the next or from one two months to the next. And people are happy that that is the case. This is the bizarre situation that, you know, at least we can make some income. And I think that's, you know, before COVID-19, the dance and theatre sector was pretty precarious in our country because of a lack of public subsidy outside of five major theatres. COVID-19 has rendered that precarity even more tenuous, and now people are finding ways to survive within that precarity. This was episode three of our fourth season of Record of Change, featuring Mike van Gaan from Cape Town. If you liked this episode or Record of Change in general, we would love to hear your feedback and even more so if you would like to share it with your networks. Follow us on your favorite podcast provider or on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube or our website recordofchange.com. If you would like supporting independent podcasts, we would be honored for you to support our efforts to bring you unique stories from across the world through being a Patreon supporter. For those supporting us on Patreon, you will have early access to episodes and behind-the-scenes insights from the Record of Change team and the opportunity to pitch questions for our interviewees alongside us. Even the smallest level of support can be a great boost as we strive to document the impact of COVID-19 on communities throughout the world. This podcast is implemented with and by members of the Bosch Alumni Network, a community that brings together former and current fellows, grantees and staff members of the Robert Bosch Stiftung and its partners. Thank you for listening.